I've been speaking to young people for over 50 years. I have four children and ten grandchildren. I hear a lot of kids tell me they don't listen to fathers, but sometimes they listen to grandfathers. <laughs> I'm a grandfather, and I want to talk to you as a grandfather. <clears throat> There's a story in the Bible about a, a young man who couldn't speak. He was tongue-tied, and he was deaf. And the Bible says somebody brought him to Jesus. I presume he's a teenager or a young person because they wouldn't have brought him. He would have come himself. The Bible doesn't name who he is, but he's tongue-tied. No doubt he has been an outcast. When he was in school, he couldn't speak. I want to talk to you about a cry that can't be voiced. A cry that can't be voiced. Some of you have this cry in you that you can't explain. Here's a boy who said, if I could only speak... His tongue is tied to the roof of his mouth. He can only utter. He can only make uttural noises. And he, he probably lived most of the time saying, if I could only speak, I, I, would, I would scream. I'm not a simpleton. I'm not a dunce. I'm not crazy. I have dreams and I have hopes just like everybody else. But he's been cast aside by society. And they bring him to Jesus and said, would you just put your hand on him? I don't know who this boy is, because, but I have an idea. I, because everything that Jesus talked about represented people in any age is till the end of time. And I think he represents the young people that have a cry in them. They don't have a voice. They don't know how to express it. I told you I have ten grandchildren. And at one particular time, one of my grandsons, I couldn't get through to. Nice kid. Wasn't drugs. Wasn't running with girls or anything. Wasn't a party boy. He just, he said, Grandpa, I, I don't know. He, he was so passive about Jesus Christ. He could come to church and hear me preach and say, I love you, Grandpa. But I, I said, why are you so passive about Jesus? Why are you, you seem to be, you're not ashamed of him, but you, you don't mention him. He, he's not in your voice. He's not in your mind. There's something in you going on. You've got to struggle. He was lifting weights one day, and I went into his garage where he lived, and I sat on the floor, and I said, I'm not leaving here until you tell me what's going on in your heart. What, what are you hiding? Why can't you tell me? You know I'm a man of God. Tell me what's going on. Why, why do you feel like you do? You can't tell anybody. You can't talk to your dad. You can't talk to your mother. You can't talk to your friends. You're all tied up inside. You've got a voice. You, you, you've got a cry in you. There's something crying in you, and you can't put a voice to it. And he said, Grandpa, I love you. He said, I can't tell you. He said, there's a bunch of stuff going on. It has to do with relationships. It has to do with... My friends, it has to do with so many on drugs now. They pull in all on all sides. The things about what's happening in the world I don't understand. Things that I don't understand at all. The confusion. i concerned about the future. And here's a kid that was a bright student. He is now since he's come through to Christ in a, in, with passion. He, he's a 3.8 student, and he had this in him, but he was just he was just eating up time. And he said, "I I can't explain it." I, and I waited. I said, "I'm not leaving here till you tell me." He said, "Well, I can't tell you." So when I got into my car to leave, I put my head on the steering wheel, and I said, "Oh God, this is my grandson, and he's got a cry in him, and he can't voice it. He can't speak it." That's when I start reading the Bible about this boy that's been brought to Jesus. They bring him to Jesus, and he's got a cry that he can't voice inside. It's like some of you here, you, you have a cry. There's, there's something going on, and you can't tell anybody about it. You can't explain it to your parents or counselor or preacher or not even your best friend. You may get on your phone, and you can talk for two or three hours. You can talk about just about anything, but you never get to the real gut issue. 
There was a drug addict in New York City, a young teenager, who was strung out on heroin. He was a mainliner. And he got so sick, there was a cry in his heart. He didn't know how he got hooked. He's only going to smoke pot, he thought, and he got hooked. <clears throat> he's robbing, he's stealing, comes from a good family. And he comes into his room that he's staying in. He's laying on a cot. And he is so desperate, doesn't know where to turn. He's been in drug programs and they didn't work. And so he stuck the needle in his vein and, and sucked the needle full of blood. Laid back on his bed and sprayed on the ceiling, H-E-L-P, help, in his own blood. You see, there was a cry in him, but he couldn't explain it. All he could say was, help. And he was saying that to God. He was saying that to anybody that would listen. And I'm here to tell you if that's all you can say. You can put on a front. You can put on a mask. And you can act like somebody that you're not. You can fool people, but you can't fool what's going on inside your heart. And God heard that cry. Came to one of our centers and, and the Lord changed his life and took away that. And he was able to voice it. He was able to speak out. He was no longer like this young man who couldn't speak. The Bible said Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd. You, you see, this, I think, was the greatest, had the greatest impact on this boy. Because he's been the center of attraction in the wrong way all this time. He's had, had people try to say something. Maybe his parents just says, well, can't, can't you explain this and can't you say something? And uh, uh, just utterances, un, un, unintelligible utterances until finally he doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't honor. He shut up in silence all by himself because I, I can't explain it. I'm tired of people making fun of me. I see kids in New York City <clears throat> dressed in gothic. I, I see them in every kind of colored hair. I see them in all kinds of situations. And, and I, I know that there's something going on in the heart. It has nothing to do with the way they're dressed. It doesn't whether you're dressed in black or white or purple or green. That's not the issue. There's something deeper going on. And it's not, hey, look at me, I'm trying to be somebody. There's a cry, and only God can hear it. No man can hear it. I'm a preacher, and I've worked for 50 years with troubled kids, and I still can't reach the heart, and I can't reach you. You're not going to be reached by something I say. It's going to be something the Holy Spirit does in your heart in the next few moments. Jesus took him away from the crowd. He said, this is not a show. And church, a real church, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into a barn makes you a horse. You can go swimming, but that doesn't make you fish. You have to have an experience. You have to have your own experience, and you don't have to go to church to get it. You didn't have to come here to get it. But by a miracle, somehow, somebody talked to you, and you came here. I don't care if you call yourself a Christian. I don't care how you go to church. You may put up your hands and sing and shout and clap your hands and do all these things and still have something so deep inside that you can't even express. And it's only between you and God. Relationships. Future. So many things that all gather together until there's, there's something inside that you want to scream. And many say, what's the use of living? What's the use? And the, the crowd of adults here, dads and moms that are here, would be shocked if they knew how many are sitting here right now that you have thought of taking your life and say, look, uh, and, and, and this happens everywhere we go. I have given invitations in some countries where we've had as many as 200 come forward saying, I've been thinking of taking my life. And they just, it's not games, it's real. It's something, and parents say, oh, that's just the, something they're going through. No, it's not something just going through. 
because the devil wants to kill you. He wants to kill you either by drugs, alcohol, confusion. He wants to destroy your life because the devil's a killer. He takes him aside because Jesus knows he has to have a personal experience. It can't be something from mom. It can't be something from dad. It can't be an experience somebody else has had and trying to share it with you. You have to have your own experience, your own encounter with Christ. And Jesus took him aside. He said, I know what he needs. He needs time just one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't want this to be a show. That's what I don't like about so-called Christian television with all its cameras and people being knocked over and young people there in camera right in their face and making a show out of it. That's an abomination for your holy God. It's an abomination. God says, no, this is something personal. It's between you and me. If it doesn't happen in this meeting, if something causes you to say, I can't do it right now, you cry out to God. There has to be a desperation. This boy is desperate. One of the young drug addicts <clears throat> came to our center and told the story of how desperate he got. Been on drugs for 15 years. He had a long track. And if you're a mainliner, you know what the track is. There's blisters in the, 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 the track that scar from shooting so many <clears throat> shots into the arm. And he was so desperate. He thought if I could, if I could just be locked in a room for three days, I could kick it. And so he steals a pair of handcuffs. I didn't even know where he got them. And he goes into his room, shuts the door, and handcuffs himself to a steam radiator. It's hooked on the wall that you get heat from. He chained himself to it with the handcuffs. And he got by for about six hours. But before that nightfall, he was so wanting a fix, he tried to pull away and all, it was just marking up his hand till nearly bleeding. But another five or six hours, he got so desperate and, and just almost like supernatural strength and gritting his teeth, he pulled the whole radiator off the wall. 50, 60 pounds, put it on his back, chained to it, and ran to the pusher to get his fix. Because, you see, you can't lock yourself into some room and, 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 and find freedom. You, you can't do it in your own strength. Another one of our guys looked at his track, and he said, every time I see my track, that's when I get a desire to get it on again so he said if I could just get rid of that track maybe I could get rid of my habit he had been in every kind of institution every kind of treatment possible and he would come out and within an hour he's back to his push he goes into his room and he puts a, a iron frying pan on a hot stove and gets it white hot he takes a towel and wraps it around the handle and closes his eyes, grits his teeth, and pushes that white hot pan on his arm to burn off his track. And there was such scream and just scorched his flesh, he dropped the pan and ran to the pusher and stuffed himself with heroin to kill the pain. Now I've seen and heard of every conceivable way of, of, of just getting some relief from pain. And Jesus looks at this young man. And the Bible said, and Jesus sighed. And in the original Greek, it is groaned. He let out a groan. Oh! He let a scream out of him. And what Jesus is screaming about, what Jesus was groaning about, he was looking down through history. He was looking down to this day right here in Melbourne. He's looking to this meeting and he saw you. He saw this meeting and he knew what you're going through. He was not only crying for that young man, 
who wanted to be able to speak and express himself and be changed and be normal. And then he's looking down at every drug addict. He's, he's looking at every kid that would be dying in Africa because their parents passed on AIDS. He was listening to the groan and the cry that's coming out of Zimbabwe right now where every day 700 are dying of AIDS and where there are thousands of children roaming the streets and he hears the cry. He hears the cry. He heard the cry of Nikki Cruz, Mau Mau gang leader on the streets of New York years ago. When I first met him, he slapped my face and said, go to hell. One of 17 children would cry himself to sleep at night. When he was three years old, his mother said she didn't want him. He was locked in a cage for many years by his own parents who were devil worshippers. He said he'd never cry again. But there were those simple little whimperings at night. What's life all about? And where does this all end? And when I first met him, I said, Nikki, Jesus loves you. And he slapped me and said, go to hell. But he couldn't get that thought out of his mind. He tried to sleep every night. And those words I said, Nikki, Jesus loves you. He had said, I could cut you in a thousand pieces. I said, well, every piece would still love you. They couldn't forget it. Nicky Cruz gave his life to Jesus Christ and has been now an evangelist for years, winning millions to Christ all over the world. And here was a young man who was all locked up inside. And folks, I remember the night he came to hear me when I had a crusade for gangs. The Egyptian lords were there, the Mau Maus, and oh, about ten different gangs were there in one meeting. I, I I didn't know any better. Looking back now, I think I must have been crazy. <laughs> and there was tension everywhere. They would mock me. A girl came out to to sing, and they whistled and hooted and and said, "Hey, baby, how about a date?" I mean, everything just chaos. And I got up to speak like I'm doing now. And there's the Mau Mau's, about 30, 40 of them in the first two rows, right, sitting over here. Tried to preach, and they were hooting and making noises. And I bowed my head and put my head on the desk, on the little desk just about this size, and said, oh, God, I'm wasting time. They don't want you. They love their sins. The Mau Mau's at the time were in the headlines, one of the most notorious gangs protecting their territory. They would fight with, with bolo balls and zip guns and every conceivable weapon. And here they are with their weapons in my meeting. And suddenly, suddenly, a holy hush. You could hear a pin drop. And the Holy Spirit whispered in heart, he said, I'm here now. And you're going to see a miracle. And I started to speak. And I said, if you guys are so tough, you think you're so tough, then let's see you take a stand for Jesus Christ and quit playing games. Spirit of God came down. Nobody's making a sound. And just before the meeting tonight in that back room, the Holy Spirit spoke the same thing to my heart. I'm going to do again today the same thing I did years ago in that meeting, my first meeting for drug addicts and alcoholics and gangs. He said, I'm going to do it again. He's doing it now. And I said, if you are not ashamed 
and you want your life changed, you could have an encounter with Jesus. Get up out of your seat and come down here unashamed because the Bible said, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. But if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So I want you to confess Christ and give him your heart. Nikki started sniffing. <laughs> he didn't want anybody to know. But suddenly he stood up. And he said, look, and he faced his gang. He said, I'm going up there and give my life to Christ. So are you. Get up. <laughs> they came. I took them over downstairs to a, what was a dressing room because this was a boxing arena where the boxers were dressing rooms. And I knelt down beside Nikki and Israel. Israel was... President Nicky was vice president of Mau Mau's. And suddenly, there was a gush of tears. Saying, oh God, nobody has ever loved me in my life. Not my parents. I almost killed my brother. Nobody has loved me. The police hate me. I have no friends. I have nobody. But if you... Love me. I'll give you my life. I'll lay my life down. And Nicky Cruz gave his life to Christ. And so did Israel. You know, I got a call the next day from a police precinct in their housing development. It was a police sergeant. He said, are you the preacher that preached to the Mau Mau's last night? And I said, yes, sir. He said, come down to precinct immediately. That was in Brooklyn. I said, oh, man, they've, they've murdered somebody, and they're using me as an alibi. <laughs> I get to the precinct, and Nick and Israel and some of the Mau Mau's are out in the street, because that night we had given them Bibles, and they had them with them. And Nick and Israel said, come on in the precinct, go to the precinct, and there's some police officers, and there's a table there. And the sergeant came from this. He said, I just wanted to meet you. He said, these guys had declared war on our department. It was unsafe for us. We had to walk two by twos. They walk in here this morning and surrender the weapons and want us to autograph their Bibles. <laughs> It, we're coming out of the precinct, and I am, I am overwhelmed. And Israel turns, he said, hey, hey, Mr. Wilson, you won't believe it, but I've been reading this book you gave me the Bible. He said, you know my name's all through it, Israel, 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 Israel. <laughs> <laughs> That's God. That's the Holy Spirit. These weren't just things that happened overnight some emotional experience and they're gone. I told you that true story because, you know, Nicky is known all over the world. There's been a movie on his life. His book, Run Baby Run, is a bestseller. Israel turned to the ministry. These testimonies go on and on and on around the world and they're happening here because we have those sitting here now among us from Teen Challenge who have been delivered from drugs, have been delivered from alcohol. But I'm speaking now to even those who call yourself a believer, a believer in Christ. Jesus says you need a real encounter. You can't be passive anymore. Not anymore because that passivity is going to lead you down the path to destruction. I'm going to tell it to you straight before I quit preaching. Jesus touches his ears and they open. He touches his tongue, touched his own tongue, and then touched the boy's tongue, and suddenly that tongue was loosened, and the boy was free. And I can tell you what I believe. It's not written in the Bible, but I believe that he hugged Jesus, and I believe they danced. 
and praised. This man began to praise Christ and spoke. And I believe it must, Jesus just sat beside him and this kid began to explain everything that he'd been going through. And he talked and he talked and he talked. He got it out of his gut. He got it out of his system. And that's what Jesus is all about. He's the best listener in the universe. He hears the cry. And some of you here listening to me now, I don't care how young, how old you are. God brought you to this meeting. And it's, it's time for a life change. Jesus didn't condemn this boy. And he's not condemning you. Jesus knows the cry. He knows what happens when you lay down at night on your bed. You can party. You, you can do these things. You, you can uh, go ahead and have sex. And then you go home. And you still have to deal with some things that God is speaking to you about. Not with condemnation, but saying, if you continue the way you're going... You think you won't end up like everybody else. You're having a good time. It's party time. And God doesn't try to scare anybody. It doesn't do, I wouldn't do me an ounce of good to stand here and try to scare you to Jesus. Because as soon as you walk out, the scare will be gone. I'm going to pray in just a moment and you're going to feel Something as deep as you've ever felt in your lifetime. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Who he sends. Because he hears. What you're thinking. I, 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 we, we hadn't planned to do this. You see, you young people here. My son and I, Gary, came here for a minister's conference. And the other night, just, uh, I guess it was, was it last night? Something, the first night that I was here a couple of nights ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I said, you've got to close out this meeting, invite the young people in. Because I want to do something in this country among young people. I want to do something supernatural. I want to raise up young people whose lives are going to count. And there are many churches here where God is doing that. But people went out in the streets. We, we, we got it. Maybe you heard on the radio. We, we hired some, some, uh, <clears throat> brought cash news and we, we just tried to get the word out and say, come. And now we come to the real issue of why you were invited here. Not to join a church. I'm not going to give you the name of any church. I'm not going to have you come and say a little prayer as if that prayer is going to change your life. But I'm going to come down to the closing issue here right now. Some of you would consider yourself religious. Religion can kill you. God's not interested in religion. He's interested in you having a personal experience that's all your own. It's something that is between you and Jesus Christ himself. And never has he spoken as clearly to you as he's speaking to you right now. Some of you who call yourself a Christian need to get some things right with God. So that your testimony is not a phony testimony. So that you're not a dual personality. You're not into hypocrisy or apostasy, but there's something burning in you. You may not be perfect and you may be going through a battle, but the Holy Spirit wants to come now and help you with that battle if you get honest with Him. If you've been laying around, if you've been playing a double life, the Lord says, no, I'm not going to condemn you, but I'm telling you it has to end now because I can't use you. And you're going to get in with the wrong crowd. And you're going to go and you're going to forsake me and you're going to leave me and break my heart. Now, others of you here, you're just beginning now to join the party life. Others of you, smoking pot. Others of you, 
have gone deeper than that. Something has got a hold of you, and it's starting to master your life. Some of you are more concerned about what your girlfriend or your boyfriend thinks than what Jesus thinks. You're thinking more about your next date than eternity. And today, we're going to see a miracle. We're going to see it in the next five minutes. I'm going to give you an invitation to get out of your seat and come up here and just stand. You're not standing before me, you're standing before Christ. And you're like that man that was brought to Jesus. Now, you see, people don't bring you to Jesus. Maybe somebody did. But see, it's different now. It's the Holy Spirit that goes out after you and finds you and brings you to Jesus. So Holy Spirit brought you here. I want everybody 25 years of age and under to stand, if you will, please. Everyone 25 years and under. I want you to stand. I'm going to pray right now that the Spirit of God, who began working with me over almost 50 years ago, about 45 years ago, in a meeting, something like this, when he began to move and show me his power and how he can change a life. And he's here now, and I'm going to pray. As I pray, you say, Pastor David, something you said today has hit me right here in my gut. I I know that I have to have a new and fresh encounter with Jesus Christ. I want you to forget the crowd. I want you to forget the fact that people may think you're something other than you know that you're not, this to me is life and death. I want you boldly to get out of your seat and come stand here. I want to pray with you and I want to minister to you. No one's going to say something silly to you. Nobody's going to ask you to speak. I am going to ask you to open your heart. I'm going to ask God to do a miracle in your life and change you. If you are a believer and something that I've said today was meant just for you, you obeyed the Holy Spirit. And as you come, there'll be others that will follow you that may not have come because you took that step. We have pl- we have not planted anybody here and say, well, you go up there so that others will come. You come because you have heard a cry. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you specifically. While I pray, just get out of your seat and come and stand here. And follow, yes, just, just come right up here and stand. That's right. Now, this is going to be a miracle night for you. You know that, don't you? Hmm? Nobody, I, nobody make a fool of you. Nobody going to say anything foolish. Do you go to church at all? Uh, not often. Not very often. Do you go to church at all? Uh, when I was very young. When you were young. Okay. All right. Move in close. Move in tight. Make room for these that are coming, if you will, please. Would you give me your hand, honey? Don't be afraid to cry. Lord Jesus, this is a night that she will never forget. You are changing her even now. You are laying your hand on her Holy Spirit in such a powerful, beautiful way. Honey, don't be afraid to cry. Jesus bottles every tear that you shed. Don't be afraid to be moved. Don't be afraid to have your emotion touched right now. Are there any others you want to come just before we change? Just step out. All right. No cameras, please. No, no cameras anywhere. Look at me. Because I've said this is life and death. We're still coming. We'll wait for you. Just a minute. I want to say this as lovingly, as gently as I can. 
And you know this is not a show. Jesus will not put up with a show. I don't want anybody in back to see your face. I want you to make sure you turn and facing me. All right. I want to know if what God told me is true. The reason, one of the reasons this meeting had to be called. I don't want to raise your hand high. I just want you to put it in front where I will see it. I want every one of you been saying, Pastor David, things have gotten so bad in my life that I have really been thinking of that same thing. There's no use living like this anymore. I've had it. Just let me see. All right? Yes, yes, okay. Okay. How old are you? Okay. Are you married? Okay. On drugs. Are you on heroin? Okay. Give me two teen challenge guys over here. Okay. Will you pray with me? This young man and this young man. Can we pray with you right now? The same thing that happened to them is going to happen to you right now. Would you put a hand on their shoulder? Take, just, just shake hands with them. Take them. Just hold his hand right there. Yeah, just hold. Right. Lord, I, I'm praying right now that these guys are getting together. The same thing that you've done here, you're going to do it again now. Here's a man that's going to be changed. I take power and authority in Jesus' name over every spirit that is bound. Lord, you're going to put your hand on this young man and you're going to transform his life. Congregation stand wherever you're at, all over this house. Friends, I have to tell you that I, I count at least 15 hands of those who don't feel there's anything worth living for anymore. And some that are on drugs. And I want God to come down in this house. I won't point you out. I, I want you to open your heart. I'm going to pray first, then I want you to pray. And I want this whole audience to pray for you, that you will have, even though there are many hundreds of people, that you'll have a personal encounter. Son, give, son, right here, would you give me your hand, please? Lord, look at me, please. You were called by God, weren't you? Were you called to be in the ministry or what? Yeah. Are you going to church at all? Jesus, you, you, you've been calling him for so long, and now he's saying yes. Will you just say that right now? Just say, yes, Jesus. I, I, this is a good night for you. God has heard your cry. Lord, thank you. You heard his cry. Now, Lord, for everyone that's standing here, Every girl, every young man, every young woman, don't let one be untouched. Congregation, pray out loud. Lord, don't let anyone be untouched. Lord, come, Jesus, and put your hand on the head of everyone that's here. Put your hand on us. Touch each one, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. Will you pray this with me? from inside. Will you, will you, look at me now. Just, just say it right out loud. Speak inside. Just close your eyes so you're not looking at other people. And I want you to pray this. Jesus, say it loud. Let me hear it. Jesus, I need you to touch me. I need my own experience. Forgive me for living for myself. And oh Jesus, I'm the one with a cry inside. And I know that you hear me. I give you my heart. I give you my faith. And I trust you now that as I give myself to you, you will give back to me the peace that I'm crying for and the joy that I've been missing. Change me, Lord. May this be the day that my life is forever changed. That I will not be a Christian just in name, but I will live in passion 
for Christ. Now I'll pray for you again, my Father. I know that it doesn't take you all night. I know that you hear the slightest cry of the heart, and I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, you've satisfied my heart that that this was the right thing to do, that there were going to be those whose lives would have been taken by the enemy. And there are those, Lord, some Christian young people that are here that go to church and that have loved you, but the enemy has been trying to pull them away. There's been a tug. There's, there's been a problem. There's been a situation. There's been a misunderstanding. There's been confusion. And there's been hurt and pain. Lord Jesus, come now by your Spirit and embrace them and heal them, I pray. Embrace them by the power of your Holy Spirit now in the name of Jesus Christ my Savior hallelujah hallelujah where are the guys that have been delivered over here from T challenge raise your hand there the guys God bless you God bless you yes something beautiful is happening here now I'm going to come against this spirit now listen to me please all of you had your hand, you went like this to me, you signaled to me. You feel like there's nothing more to live to, and some of you have even thought of it. And you were only a day, two, or a week away from doing this. There are probably two or three of you that wouldn't be here in another week. And I'm not being uh, theatrical. I've been at this for 50 years, and I know what I'm talking about. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to pray. That's a spirit. It's a lying spirit. That's when the devil comes and implants a lie into your heart. In the first place, you cannot take your life because you end up immediately in a godless hell fire. I have to tell it to you straight. You don't just vanish and that's it. There's an eternity. And the enemy trying to rob you of your very life. And that's the spirit. And I'm going to ask you to believe God right now. And I'm going to pray that nobody here ever entertains that thought again. And that God plucks it out of your heart. And we're going to have everyone in this house agree. I want you to just bow your head and we're going to believe God right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord, and God. I take your authority, Lord, not my authority, but the authority that is in your word and in your blood. Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, deliver from this lie that Satan is implanted in some hearts here standing before me. And I pray not one will ever be lost. Not one. Satan, you can't have one. Not one. Now build a wall of fire. <laughs> a protecting wall of fire around their minds and around their bodies and around their future. In Jesus' name. Now, I want you, everybody came forward. Just lift up your hands to Jesus. And that says, Lord, here I am. I give it all. And begin to thank him in your own words. Just thank him. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for touching me. Thank you for a wall of fire around my mind now and around my body. And I trust that Jesus has heard my cry. Now just thank him right out loud. Just say thank you, Jesus. Music team, will you come up here and get ready to sing? Now you can put your hands down. Doesn't take God all night. Doesn't take God all day. He's here. Now, if you believe what Jesus said, if you believe that God answers prayer, and he does, then give me a smile. Yes, because the Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. The evidence of faith is peace and rest. If you really believe what God says, if you really believe that he answers that cry, if you believe that he's the same Christ that healed this boy, he's healing you, then he brings peace and rest, and that then leads to joy. Now, some of you may never been in a church that <clears throat> claps their hands. You may have just came in. Somebody handed you some announcement about the meeting. <clears throat> the Bible says, this, if you get a Bible, it would be the same one I have. 
it'll say the same thing. Clap your hands and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. In other words, be happy in Christ. Be happy in Jesus. Uh, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. I want you, I, I, I want you to celebrate Jesus. A whole congregation, we're going to sing it together with you. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Stay right where you're at just for the